Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to our webinar this evening on chest X-rays, CTs, and MRIs and preparing for the USMLE. Um, to briefly introduce ourselves, so my name is Sana. I am a second a PGY2 first year radiology resident. Um, I'm at Brigham and Women's Hospital, and I'm excited to share um, everything I know about radiology with all of you this evening. And I'll let my co-host introduce himself as well. Hi, my name is Blake Snyder. I am a, or Blake, <laughs> I'm a resident <laughs> at University of Colorado here in Denver, and I'm going out to UC Davis for ophthalmology next year. So briefly, the agenda for tonight is um, pretty much all radio radiology and how to approach radiographic images. So we're going to give you general approaches um, for all different modalities. So we're going to start with x-rays because that is the most common thing that you'll see on your USMLE exams. Um, and then chest, abdominal, and head CTs as well. We'll talk briefly about MRIs, but the, the focus of this uh, discussion today will be mostly x-rays and quite a bit of CTs as well. The important things that we want you to know um, as you approach these is that there are a lot of different key things to be thinking about when you're addressing these questions. The first is always, always, always use the vignette. Even I, as a radiologist, think it is extremely important to look at the history before you look at any of the images. Um, I think that that really tailors your sensitivity and specificity and helps you to sort of guide your thinking because there's a lot, and especially reading these images in the 60 seconds that you have when you're looking at these questions, you don't have time to do a very detailed systematic approach. So it's very important to guide your thinking by looking at that history. And these images, they're not going to be very subtle findings, right? If you're going to see a pneumothorax, it's going to be a huge pneumothorax. It's not going to be a tiny little apical pneumothorax. So don't really spend time looking at the nitty gritty. Look at the general gestalt and say, okay, is something jumping out at me. Like I said, if you don't recognize something, don't panic. History, history, history. I will say that 80% of images can, or 80% of these questions, excuse me, can be solved without even looking at the image. The image should serve as more of a confirmatory test rather than this is what I need to make my diagnosis for the USMLE question. And again, you don't need to know everything about reading a CT or reading an x-ray to be able to answer the question, right? So you just need to be able to identify the most obvious, the most sort of critically important um, findings that, that are on the image. Um, any other thoughts on that, Like Any other tips that you would impart before we delve into the actual images? Yeah, thank you so much, Sana. Yeah, I, I just wanted to echo this point. I really think that um, when I work with my students, that's a huge thing I recommend is really trust your assessment before looking at the image and, and try and use the image, see if something jumps out at you. But if not, trust yourself and trust what your, your question approach tells you. I mean, you do thousands and thousands of questions by the time you take your step usually, and only a portion of those have uh, radiologic images. So really you have more practice um, in your assessment. So, so trust that when all else fails. All right. Well, I think it's always important when you're going through x-rays to, to have an approach. As Sana was saying, you don't have all the time to, to go a full, through a full assessment of the x-ray. So you want to focus on what's really important. And uh, I think it's nice to have something to fall back to when stress is high. And so A, B, C, D, E is something that we can all remember. So um, I, when looking at this, the main thing I'm looking at in the x-ray is, is the airway midline. Are there any broken bones uh, within the lung fields? Um, are there a normal amount of ribs? Am I getting normal expansion? Then I wanna look at the heart. I wanna look at the cardiac borders, my C, my circulation. Particularly, I'm looking for um, heart failure most. That's one thing I really uh, wanna have students look for because if the heart is greater than half the CP diameter, then that's gonna indicate maybe this isn't actually a pulmonary issue, but a cardiac issue. What do you think about that, Sana? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that the, the initial approach is really helpful in making sure you don't miss things. Um, and this is very, very easy to do because everyone sort of goes to the lungs, right? Chest x-ray, you think lungs, lungs, lungs. And I'll be honest, eight times out of 10, you'll be right. 
but there will be those other things that you can pick up on chest x-ray, which again, I think is one of the hardest things to read because there are all these overlapping structures um, but really, really important to go through a systematic approach to make sure you're not missing something obvious. Absolutely. And talking about missing things, you do not want to miss D. Um, so when you're looking at D, you always want to look for free air under the diaphragms. Um, that's a huge thing that they tell you. You want to look yeah. at the diaphragm borders, particularly looking at the costophrenic angles for effusions as well. Um, greater than one centimeter on, on lateral decubitus, you want to get... Um, get some fluid there for assessment. So all these things help. And then uh, look at everything else. Uh, and particularly when I say everything else, I usually say, look at the kind of top borders and make sure that the lung fields are equal there um, because pneumothoraces are also a pretty common diagnosis here. And kind of just to go through that same process here in visual format, um, we want to look through A, that our airway is midline. We want to look at the bones, particularly. I'm not, I, see, I feel like B is a, something that I go through a little bit faster in my process here. Um, it, unless it's kind of a trauma um, situation. I'm not looking as closely at the bones here, um, but always good to, to, to not miss anything to have a process. So you look at the bones. Um, cardiac border the, here, um, make sure it's less than half the, the chest diameter. And then look down at the diaphragms. And when you look at the diaphragms, uh, I always like to look for air under the diaphragm, particularly on the, the left side under the, the liver, because there's, it's gonna be soft tissue against the diaphragm. There's never gonna be any air there. So you should never see any lucency or any dark spots. Uh, as opposed to the other side, sometimes you can get a gastric bubble um, and that can actually look sometimes like air under the diaphragm. So I encourage kind of for the non-radiologist over here mm -hmm. to stick to the <laughs> right side. <laughs> uh, um, so the laterals, exactly like Blake said, these are much less commonly seen. And really what the, the key things that they'll show, so first I'll just go through the anatomy briefly, right? So this is where the heart is, right? Here we're looking at the verte vertebral bodies. This is sort of the aortic arch here. And here you can see this is where the trachea comes through. And then this is approximately where the hilums are. And they're overlapping, right? So you can't really differentiate super well, which is left, which is right. So that's one of the difficulties, obviously, of x-rays. The big things that you're looking for here would be something like the quote unquote spine sign is like a classic thing they look for. Um, the spine, you can see vertebral bodies here are quite white, white, little lighter, little lighter, more transparent, more transparent. Here you can see much more black than you could up there, right? And that's, that's the normal pattern. You can see it more lucent as you move down because you don't have as many overlying vascular and mediastinal structures. If you see that this is darker, or not darker, but if you see it's whiter rather, um, and that there, that suggests that there's a mass, or not a mass, but that suggests that there's a consolidation or some sort of process there that should not be there. Whether that's pneumonia versus mass, who knows, get a CT, but um, that's one of the key things that they're gonna try and show you on the laterals um, for the purposes of the USMLE. The lower lobe pneumonia, I remember that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh yeah. <laughs> Another thing that just that photo reminded oh, me yeah. of a little, bit of a, a little bit of an external tangent, but I feel like the thoracic cavities is another high yield kind of mm. topic to, to study, you know, close to the exam. It's not a topic that I feel like is sticks for a very long period of time. Definitely. So yeah. that's kind of a, a good one to, to review close to the exam. Sometimes they'll tell you that hint of kind of what thoracic cavity something is, and that will a limit, limit your differential quite a bit. Definitely. Yep. Anterior mediastinum, middle mediastinum, posterior mediastinum, big differentials. Um, and I think the differential changes significantly based on where you are. Perfect. And so now we went over a little bit of the normal, right? And we briefly touched on, you know, spine sign, et cetera. So now I wanted to talk about the abnormal things you see on chest x-ray and the words that we sometimes use in radiology that other people are like, what do those words even mean? Um, and how, how, how those words mean something and what those patterns mean in terms of the imaging. So types of opacification. So chest x-ray, all you're looking for really is, is there something white that should not be there, right? Because the lungs should be completely black. You know, obviously there's vascular structures, et cetera. You'll see some degree of white. Is there more white than I expect to see? And is the white 
a linear sort of branching pattern, a reticular pattern, right? That suggests something linear, something that's like, looks almost like straws, right? Like just branches of a tree versus a nodular pattern. And that is exactly describing what it sounds like. More nodules concerning for more solid lesions, something a little more either pulmonary nodules versus cavities versus something else, something rounded like a mass versus airspace opacities, right? So this is again, going back to the anatomy that we learned, God knows when, um, all of those grapes on a leaf are grapes on a bunch, right? That's what the lung looks like. That's the alveolus, right? So that alveolar pattern is more of a fluffy pattern and it's not quite as linear and branching. It's more of like an external, this is the furthest part from the actual vasculature. And this is the actual closest part to the, um, the actual gas exchange. Um, so those are the things we're looking for. And so this, is how I would describe this, right? Looking at this image. And so what I would love for you guys to do is please feel free to throw out what you think the answer is in your chat, any descriptors um, and what, what you're thinking sort of as I talk through this. Um, so what I'm seeing here is the cardiomediastinal silhouette is pretty obscured. I can't very clearly trace out an outline. Airways midline looks okay. Bones very quickly just doing a check nothing jumping out at me is broken, right? And then cardiomediastinal, I mentioned, diaphragms, oh, it might be a pleural fusion here. I don't see a clear meniscus, but I also don't see a sharp costophrenic angle. Same thing on this side, even more so. And then I see all of these sort of this whiteness, right? This sort of hard to describe whiteness that starts more centrally, right? It's more central and predominant, and then it extends outwards. But the periphery actually looks not too, too bad right? Maybe a little whiter than I would expect, but not terrible. So I'm, I would describe this as a reticular or linear branching appearance, central predominant, and going outward. So think about anatomically what's there, right? Now we're thinking about like high layer vessels, right? So you have the actual bronchus, and then you also have the pulmonary arteries, which are going out and supplying the, um, supplying the lungs. And so those are the two things that are going out. And so when I see this, especially in this branching pattern, again, the hilum, it is all branching, right? So anytime you see this branching pattern, central predominant, I want you to think of pulmonary edema. So this is this sort of central predominant, branching outwards, pulmonary edema, and you have, in this I would call severe, right? Severe congestive pattern, cardiomegaly, which also supports this, pro this process. Um, and sort of all of these reticular opacities, central predominant branching out. Any Anything you would add to that, uh, Blake? Anything that I'm missing here? Yeah, um, just a couple of things um, that, you know, I just want to kind of echo that you're saying. Of course, yeah. I see, you know, I work, when I work with students, one thing that I see students say here is this, and I'm seeing students say this in the chat as well, is this kind of interstitial platform pattern. And mm -hmm. I feel like the diagnosis of, of interstitial pneumonia comes up a lot more kind of in my students kind of diagnosis than this mm -hmm. kind of pulmonary edema picture. And I think right. just that, as you're saying, interstitial pneumonia will be kind of more diffuse as opposed to this is kind of decreasing as it goes outwards. And that's, right. and right. that's, as you said, just mimics the anatomy, the vessels are tapering off as they go outwards. And so you're going to see kind of more of this opacification kind of near the central uh, portion of the x-ray. Is that kind yeah. of right from a radiology yeah. standpoint? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely agree. Okay. Awesome, all right. Okay, next case. Oh man, look at this. Okay, well, so sticking to our, our pathway, we don't wanna forget anything here. So we wanna go down, we wanna see that our air, airway is midline here. And we can see our heart, it looks a little bit more narrow than normal, almost kind of like it's hanging. Um, and then here, uh, uh, sorry, I forgot my B, you gotta stick to your, to your, your pathway. Mm -hmm. So going down, uh, my, no broken bones, um, and maybe a little bit more ribs than I normally see. Uh, then, sorry, sticking to my C, uh, a normal cardiac border and maybe a little bit less than, than half, so maybe uh, a little bit smaller. Looking at my diaphragms, making sure I'm not any, missing any free air under the diaphragms uh, and my costophrenic angles look sharp. 
And then I'm looking kind of everywhere else, as I say, I wanna make sure that I see kind of equal things here in my apices. And everyone has a different pathway, but make sure that you kind of develop one for yourself and you can do it quickly and it becomes second nature. Um, but let's let's kind of look here at the at the at some of what some of pe people have said here. So emphysema it looks like a calmer one. Hi hyperinflation, absolutely. Nice. Nice. I think this is COPD. So uh, emphysema would be you know it's a, certainly a category there. Perfect. Awesome. And okay. yeah, so I think the Did big I... the, no the the only things that I would really say is like you're seeing us go through the search pattern. And this is what I want you to do in real life, right? When you're practicing looking at x-rays, make sure you're going through this. But a lot of you very quickly saw this and were like, oh, emphysema, I'm done. And that's on the exam, how I want you to do it. Um, for real life, I want you to try and practice, A, because it'll make you better at reading scans, and B, because you might miss something. But for exam purposes, if they show you this, that is all they're trying to show you. They're not going to hide a rib fracture in this as well, right? They're going to just try and show you the most obvious thing. Um, so only only additional points. Yeah, absolutely. Stay focused on the exam. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So let's take it through, us through this vignette. So if we were reading it from the, the very top, um, we would read it. A 34-year-old African-American woman with a history of asthma presents to the emergency department complaining of a dry cough and worsening shortness of breath for the past six months. Review of systems reveals decreased visual acuity. Her family history is notable for a maternal aunt who died suddenly from cardiac arrest at age 41. Physical exam reveals vitals 99.1, blood pressure 110 over 82, heart rate 74, respiratory rate 20, O2 sats 96% on room air, and decreased breath sounds of the bases bilaterally. I recognize this question. Uh, I have done it with all of my students and we do it <laughs> and, uh, so it looks very familiar. So um, as we go through this question, um, I want you to, to try and think about the way that you would take this question. Uh, I want you to think about certain points that you'd pick out and kind of how you'd approach this. Uh, often I, I take the approach of trying to read some of the last things first uh, when I approach a question because I feel like those objective findings are always true when some of the subjective findings are just risk factors. So that's one of the things that I would have started with. So I would probably start down here actually with pulmonary function testing is set FVC is 70% and her ratio is 0.85. So to me, when I go back to the beginning of this question, I actually have a very different differential in mind. I now have restrictive lung diseases in my mind rather than any lung diseases. So when I'm coming up with a differential, I'm deciding on a much more kind of descript details when I'm going through the question approach. How would you do it, Sana? Yeah, I, I do the exact same thing. I always, I start with a question and sort of, I tend to go line by line. So I see 34 off, a 34 year old African American woman, right? And that, for US MLE purposes, they're setting you up for something, right? They're giving you that information for a reason. Young woman, African American, what is sort of common things um, in that population? Then, of course, PFTs, clearly a lung issue, family history of something, not really sure how it plays in yet. And then again, going through the data, all the data I have after I sort of have an idea of, okay, what am I even thinking about? And all of that sort of sets you on the, sets you on the path. Absolutely. And being an ophthalmologist here, I have to say, you know, when they <laughs> throw, throw in something systemic, throw in something weird, um, often they're telling you that for a reason. Sarcoid um, uh, is a pot is has, um, uh, I spoiled it here. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people are already getting it. You're good. <laughs> All right. So um, take, a, take me through kind of what your differential would be here. Yeah, so when you sort of look at this, as, as Blake said, restrictive lung disease, right? So that's the first thing, because you have these FEVs. And that, because I think one of the easiest things to do is to use FEVs because it's very clearly one or the other, right? You use that data and it tells you one way or the other. The other things you look for are, again, this, um, the vitamin, uh, excuse me, the, uh, da -da 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 -da, what am I looking at? The calcium level, right? Because of the, because of the, um, the vitamin D uh, absorption or the, 
Yes, because of ACE, uh, the vitamin D absorption in these patients. Um, and so all of these things are giving you hints towards sarcoids and towards sarcoids. I would not even look at the chest x-ray until the very end where I'm like, okay, I feel like I'm pretty confident it's sarcoid. And if it's sarcoid, uh, I'll pose this to the, the broader group. If it's sarcoid, what would you expect to see on the chest x-ray? Without even looking at this x-ray, what, what am I looking for? What are the big things I'm looking for? Awesome. Yeah, a lot of people are already putting it out there. Great, great, great work. Um, so bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy, right? So that's the key thing I'm looking for. And I think I see that, right? This hilar area, it's a little bit enlarged. This one, not as much, but I could argue maybe a little bit. Um, this consolidation here can throw people off. This is not hilar lymphadenopathy, but this definitely is, right? And so look for those sort of key findings. And the other thing I'll say is um, the interstitial fibrosis. So here you can see these lungs just look junky, right? It just looks like they have a lot of stuff going on. And sarcoid often has an interstitial pattern on top of their hilar lymphadenopathy. The hilar thing is classic, right? If you see that, you that should be your first thought for sure. Um, but you can also see this interstitial pattern. Yeah, absolutely. And just to loop back, I see a question here that I want to bring in. So, um, so the vitamin D from the question, mm -hmm. so it's sarcoid, um, the increased ACE levels in the lungs uh, will lead to increased vitamin D, which leads to hypercalcemia. Upper limit of normal for hypercalcemia is 10.2. Uh, here is 10.8. So, so mildly hypercalcemic. Yep. Um, yep. Just to just to touch. Um, quickly on the on the question approach that I kind of skimmed over. I think that you know when I come to the question, the first thing I do is I glance at the image. If something jumps out at me, like COPD in the last example, I take that and I run with it. If I don't mm -hmm. know things, if, as then this is as a non radiologist, uh, um, is that you know when I look at it, if it jumps out at me, great. If not, I'm going to stick to my question approach. I'm going to stick to the fact this is a restrictive lung disease and an African-American woman with decreased visual acuity and hypercalcemia. Okay, so I think this is sarcoid. And then what I do is exactly what Sana said. I try and look at this image and say, can I see bilateral lymphad hilar lymphadenopathy? And I say, you know what? I can convince myself of that. And I yeah. kind of put the mental gymnastics to confirm what I already thought of in my assessment. And that kind of yep. pattern, I think, is really helpful. All right, yeah, we can move absolutely. on. Sorry about that. <laughs> oh no, no, I, th I think I mean this is these are the kinds of thoughts that you should be doing really when you're going through these questions in your head, right? And then just to sort of touch on some of the other things they'll say, this is a this is still a first order question, right? Because they're just asking you the diagnosis, but they could make this even harder and again ask the disease process, the pathogenesis, the risk of complications, the treatments. Um, so just, again, all of this has to do with A, do you know everything about this disease? Do you know the imaging, the lab, the treatment, the complications? And it's drawing you backwards from one thing and expects you to go forward with another. So just make sure you make sure you know everything, I guess, is the summary of that. <laughs> Absolutely.